Uh, and some of the studies were also done in Germany and the UK, and those were the first countries that started uh, take, taking steps on trying to avoid uh, endogamy. Uh, and in those countries, it's uh, usually seen as uh, being portrayed as negative, uh, as having negative effects on your uh, networks, negative effects on how productive you are. Uh, sometimes they find effects of uh, being uh, more focused institutionally, if you are from that institution, so you would take more hierarchical positions, uh, or you would focus more on advising students or writing books, while uh, professors that come from other institutions would be more focused on publishing papers, for example. Um, and so the US, Germany, and England are countries that try to avoid that practice. But, but we see that both uh, mature systems and younger systems uh, have been dealing with this issue. And countries like Japan, Spain, and France have uh, higher levels of academic inbreeding taking place, uh, just as uh, younger systems like Brazil, Argentina, and Eastern European countries have. Uh, and there are different reasons why this could take place. It could be basically agency or personal preference, uh, which could uh, uh, end up being uh, a, a way of doing, having nepotism in the university, where, for example, advisors would be pushing for their advisees should be hired after they finish their PhD. And it could also be co con convenience if, you know, uh, this, uh, you went to that school, that's where you live your whole life. In Brazil, we don't have I think just after we started having an name, that's when we have started having students moving more around, but we have been used to not moving states to go to the university. So people are not really used in Brazil to be as mobile as they are in other countries. So it could also be a matter of convenience where you're just gonna try to apply to the universities that are nearby. Uh, and uh, it could be structural limitations. So it could just be that whenever you have a selection of professors, you always have the same pool of applicants, people who apply or, or people who feel the requirements uh, are those that went to your uh, program. So you basically have to take from that pool of applicants. So it's a structural limitation. It's the, higher, the way that the higher education system is designed. So uh, on my first paper, when I was looking at the different, uh, how academic in inbreeding or endogamy uh, takes place in Brazil, I found that overall nationwide, it's not that high. It's around 23%. But uh, this is a lot because certain regions and states in the north, northeast, the levels are, are very low. We also had a lot of, uh, especially in the federal system, a lot of uh, federal universities being recently created. And they have also had to hire people from other institutions. So that drops the, the number of faculty members that would be from that uh, new institution. Uh, but if we look at by distinct regions, states, types, uh, you will see that uh, elite research universities, especially in the south and southeast of Brazil, have high numbers. Uh, the University of Sao Paulo, for example, its main cam campus, 70% of the faculty members uh, did their PhD at that institution. Um, and that's even when controlling for uh, cam campus. So like, if, if I'm controlling for someone that went to USP Piracicaba, but now works at uh, USP Sao Paulo, I'm not considering that to be uh, the same institution. I'm considering it to be a different one because it's different cities, different campus, but it's still the numbers are, the percentages are very high. So it seems that uh, it, this seems to take place in the, among the main providers and most prestigious consumers of the well-trained workforce in Brazil. And uh, 
then moving on from that, uh, after I identified that this was taking place, especially in elite research universities, I, uh, for my second paper, I started looking, well, so are there differences when we look at different outcomes? So uh, I looked at the amount of off, uh, offered courses, how many students they advised as undergrads, grad students, number of papers published, what was the rank of those uh, journals, numbers of books, pat pat patents, conferences. And overall, uh, I, I could not find significant differences uh, when you look only at uh, where you went to school and where you work. Uh, but when you actually look at mobility wise, so uh, it could just be a matter that it's not based on where you work, but it's based on how exposed you were to other environments. Uh, so when you look at mobility, so sometimes you may work at the same institution, but you maybe did a sandwich PhD abroad, uh, or maybe you did a postdoc before you took that position, or maybe even after you took that position as a professor, you went for a, for a, a visiting scholar, as a visiting scholar away, uh, or you changed the institutions in the middle of your career. So all those different types of mobilities can add to your exposure. And when I look at those variables, uh, I identify that especially scholars who have uh, been exposed to a foreign academic experience, uh, they seem to be more likely to publish at better journals and less likely to uh, submit their, their papers to worse journals. Uh, and also they seem to have more focus on advising uh, PhD students. So uh, even though uh, previous studies have uh, identified some negative effects, it can vary from country and from system. Uh, and even the types of methodologies that were adopted before, they, some of them usually don't look at other types of mobilities that scholars are exposed to. They only look at where they went to school and where they work. So that limits the kind of uh, measurements that can be done. So then for my third paper, uh, I was thinking, okay, so uh, I would expect that if uh, you work at the same institution where you studied, you might have a more limited network. Your network might be more clustered, right? Maybe you're gonna continue working with your previous advisor, with professors that you have studied with, or colleagues that were also hired with you uh, from your cohort. So maybe you are limiting your opportunities of uh, connecting uh, with other people. So this, I don't know if you can see, but these are quintuplets. So it's uh, five uh, siblings. Uh, and I'm just questioning like, would that have an effect of maybe all these professors are just following their advisors and maybe following the same ideas, the same theories, uh, limiting uh, their access to new ideas. So uh, I know social network analysis, some of you have taken classes, uh, but uh, not everyone uh, has been studying the topic. Uh, social network analysis is uh, very interdisciplinary. When you, we look at the different papers in the field, you're gonna find papers, especially like in physics, but you're also gonna find in, in math, medicine, uh, education, uh, business, all those different fields try to, to measure different effects that social networks can cause. For example, in medicine with uh, COVID, for example, you can try to see if, uh, like in the case of Georgia, where you had people that attended a funeral, uh, you've identified that some people who attended that funeral, they also got COVID. So you try to see who attended that funeral. Uh, so you look at an event, and people who attended the event. So that's a type of, for example, affiliation network that a lot of uh, physicians uh, like to study, like this spread of HIV or like other disease and how they can uh, affect communities. So this is a way that uh, it's used in, in fields like medicine. Uh, 
But you also have, for example, in uh, one mode network that we're going to use in this study, uh, you can look at the different actors. So you can see how actors interact, who they interact with. And sometimes you can even, in this case, we don't have direction because we're looking at co-authoring and co-writing of papers and research. But sometimes when you look at, at what we see here as ego networks, you're, you can even look at, direct, look at directions. So you can see, for example, I may think, if you ask me, is Rodrigo your friend? I may say, yes, Rodrigo is my friend. But then when you ask Rodrigo if he thinks I'm his friend, he may say, no, I know Luis, but he's not my friend. So in my ego network, I'm gonna identify Rodrigo as being a direct contact, but a Rodrigo is not gonna identify me as a, a direct contract, uh, contact as a friend. So there are different ways that you can uh, do different measurements uh, with social networks. And here uh, is just some of the language that uh, I'm gonna use. So I'm gonna ex briefly explain them. So here you have some examples of uh, what we call nodes or vertices. Uh, and nodes are what you also can call an actor. It's uh, each dot is an individual in this case. And you're gonna look at the edges and the links of those individuals. So uh, you see the darker uh, line, the black line, those are strong ties. So uh, it's someone that you uh, are connected not only directly, but you have other people people connected to, to that person. And maybe you have been working with uh, uh, that person more frequently. So it's a stronger connection, right? You, you have it more clustered. You see like group A, for example, it's uh, quite clustered. You have a lot of the nodes connected to each other. So we call those uh, edges, uh, uh, we call them strong ties. And you have in the dotted line, what we call weak ties, uh, which is usually identified as being an opportunity to exchange ideas. Because basically you can see that, for example, you here in this uh, picture, you has access to two networks that other members of his network uh, don't have. So he can talk to people in group A and group B and he might get information that in his own group he cannot get. Uh, so usually uh, theories of weak and strong ties uh, and also the, the theory of structural holes, uh, they will say that basically if you have two clustered networks, you're missing out on information. Information is gonna come to you much slower than to other people. Uh, and you need to have people who would be connectors or brokers that would build bi bridges between networks so that you can get faster access to new information uh, and not only be relying on redundant contacts that kind of share the same information in that group. Uh, and there are different uh, ways that you can measure how central an actor is. You can look at the most simple one, which is degree. And degree, you're basically just counting how many edges you, uh, each node has. Uh, in degree, you're looking at the direction. So I'm identifying how many people I know, for example. Uh, and out degree, how many people know me. And we can do more advanced uh, analysis like eigenvector that's trying to uh, give certain uh, levels of how central that person is in terms of who they know. So sometimes you might not know a lot of people, but you might know key people that can connect you to other people. So those would have higher values of eigenvector. But for this study, I'm gonna focus more on what we call between a centrality, which are this uh, different actors that uh, help build those bridges between uh, networks uh, trying to connect and, and uh, share information. Uh, so here is just to 
you know, should give you some of the math behind between a centrality. But the whole idea is that when you're trying to measure between a centrality, you are counting the short paths. So uh, there are different ways that you can uh, get in contact with people. Uh, sometimes you know that person, so it's like a direct contact, but sometimes you have to go through other people, right? Uh, so between the centrality is trying to look at how many paths and what's the shortest path that you can take to get to that other person. Uh, so here, for example, you see that B is connecting two different uh, network groups. So uh, for different members of V1 to get to people, uh, members of V2, uh, the shortest path is going through uh, V. So V is going to be on the way. They don't have direct connections. Uh, so when you're measuring, you're basically calculating how many paths you have to go through V uh, that otherwise you will have to do directly. Uh, and the whole idea of this uh, came with uh, Grant Overture. He was the first uh, author that discussed this idea that if you have strong ties, it's good because it's usually people you know, uh, people that uh, are committed to you, and that can, it's like is easily available information and uh, you, you know them and you can rely on them. But uh, in his theory, he explains that when you have weak ties, those are strategic because people who are connected to weak ties, uh, they uh, are able to have more access to information and then they become key to a network because if you want to get new information, you would have to go through that person. I see that there are some questions here. Uh, let's just check it. Yeah, Professor Marching has one. Oh, okay. So uh, yeah, when I say better journals, uh, I'm looking at uh, the ranking that uh, Qualys uses in Brazil, because that's usually the rank that's used for you to, for your graduate program to be funded in Brazil. And I know that there is a lot of controversy on like, are those actually the best journals that they could have published? Because it's a list of journals that are identified by a group of researchers. And there are studies being done. Alauzi has presented before about this. Uh, but in terms of financing and your graduate program having uh, receiving good grades, usually uh, if you are focusing your publications in papers that are considered A1, uh, you are more likely to have for your program to be better evaluated, for you to get more funding, more, res uh, more research funding, more uh, scholarships. So all those different things are connected to um, the grade that you're going to get for your, the program you're uh, a faculty member of. Yeah, but Luis, the, I, that's good to use that ranking because that ranking is what's motivating people to publish. But on the other hand, I think, uh, I remember, uh, I remember Alois's work uh, quite well. Uh, I think there's a, a tendency to rank uh, foreign journals higher on average. I, mean, I don't, my only point is that when, I think you can fall back on, on the ranking, but on the other hand, you should check whether that ranking is actually biased toward foreign journals. And mm -hmm. if it is, then it's a kind of endogenous issue because if I'm abroad, I probably learn the language better Therefore, I can publish. Also, it, if I remember Alois's work, uh, it's much easier for someone who's not great at a foreign language. It's much easier if you're in a physical science mm -hmm. to publish in a foreign journal because you know, just there's little articles just reporting on some experiment or something. 
if you happen to be, if I remember, in her stuff, there are very few people in humanities and social sciences publishing abroad. Because yeah. there, you got to really be pretty good at the foreign language to write those articles, as you guys know. So uh, I, I think you just have to discuss that. I'm not, I'm not saying it should, uh, they have to spend a lot of time on it, but you should realize that there might be a bias in, in your result. Yeah, no, uh, I agree with you that uh, language uh, could be a, a barrier. Uh, we see a lot of funding being asked when uh, research programs are financed. Uh, some of the funding is asked to, for example, translate papers. Uh, so uh, there, are, there are limitations. Uh, and well, you can, you can check this. You can check this by doing it by, by just seeing if there is a difference between, um, in your result, between mm -hmm. physical sciences, agriculture, agriculture is the area where they, the most publications abroad, I think that agriculture in Brazil is a very, they publish a lot in foreign journals. So it's just a question using your variable of whether, where they, you know, whether they spend time abroad or not, mm -hmm. is that affected by l looking uh, w within physical sciences, agriculture, stuff like that, versus humanities, social science? That's yeah. All. No, on my regression, I do control for fields. Oh, you do? Uh, I do, yeah. Uh, and... Uh, it, it seems to, yeah, it seems to make a difference. By fields, definitely makes a difference. Okay. Um, so have I answered your, fully answered? Yeah, if, if, I think you should just make sure you discuss it, the fact that you have the, the difference, that you did find a difference by field. Okay. okay. And, and what the reason for that might be. Okay. No, I will highlight, it's just that it, because this is part of my second paper, I try to not put a lot of things from that paper on this uh, presentation, uh, but, I, but I do control for that. All right. Lu Lu Luis, I, ha I have a doubt. Yeah. Luis, uh, it's, well, it's, a, it's, a, it's an old question from Capis, okay? Okay. So, uh, have you checked if the students that took their full PhD abroad they have the same uh, performance afterwards as the students that only took the, the sandwich PhD. Did, did you do anything about that? So yeah, so one of the regressions model, uh, so one I just look at mobile, like, do you go abroad? Do you move around? It's just looking at like national and international. And the, the third model that I look at is by different types of mobility. And then I differentiate full PhD and sandwich PhD. Uh, and full PhD uh, does a little better, like sig it's a significant difference, but it's more significant for full PhDs than for uh, sandwich PhDs. But they both uh, do publish uh, in, in, in better ranked journals, both, both types. Uh, but uh, full PhDs are more likely. Uh, okay, but I also look at even like, I know it's not a lot of scholarship, but I look at like full masters, I look at mobility before the, like during under, uh, undergraduate studies, uh, and I look at uh, visiting scholars and postdocs, and all those make a difference. Even if you do after in your career, you still identify that they are more likely. To, to publish at more uh, better ranked journals according to parties. Luis, I have and there a is, there is the, what? Uh, I have a question also, but I don't know if I should wait until the end or what, what do you no, prefer? Sure, just, just ask. Okay. Um, how did you control, because it's very common here in Brazil to do the undergraduate here and then do a master outside and, the, and then do the PhD at the same institution. This is very common here. Um, at least in the fields where I'm used to 
to work with. So mm. we management, public management, and so on. And in these cases, this is considered to be a, a native person or not, because this person only did the master outside, but the undergraduate and the PhD at the same institution. So this person, person is considered to be a native or a non-native? Yeah, so in, in this study, I consider them to be natives if they did their full PhD uh, at the same institution where they were hired right after. Uh, and most studies do that. Uh, I only saw one study that tried to go back and went back uh, all the way to masters. But uh, studies, it's very hard, like with, I'm going to show that for the third paper, uh, I basically do some scraping of the Latches database. And then in Latches, you can find more information because then people are going to put not only their last degree, but they're also gonna add where they did their masters and their undergrads. Uh, but when I first started doing this research, I was only do, uh, using uh, CAPIS database. So I used the Plataforma Sucupira in Coleta CAPIS. And those two databases only have your last degree. Uh, uh, so it's, it only gives you uh, your PhD. So maybe, some people did the undergraduate and the master in another institution, but if they did the PhD and they are a, a professor in the same institution, they are considered to be native. Yes, and that's, um, that's almost every study in, 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 in endogamy uh, treats the same way. They, they look at uh, where you went to school. The difference that is that sometimes they will look at like, okay, but did you, were you uh, away for some time before you took that job, right? Like, did you move to do a postdoc in between being hired? And then they consider that to be uh, silver corded as someone that had some experience before they took that first job in, in, in their alma mater. And, and they also differentiate uh, people who first started at a different institution and then after a couple of years, they came back which is, for example, more common here in the US, where maybe if you're a Stanford student, you're not gonna be hired right away, but once you spend some time away, uh, and they might hire you back, right? After you have shown some uh, professional experience, you have been exposed to another university. Okay. Okay, so uh, the motivation to do this third paper, it's uh, basically that very little is known about how uh, scholars who have more clustered networks, or at least that's what would be expected, right? If you work at the same institution. So more homogeneous networks, uh, it uh, hasn't been studied yet. So uh, it, seems to be an interesting topic to just look and see if you can actually find differences in how these uh, scholars behave. And if they are more open or less open and if they promote or not uh, members of this network to actually go after uh, other networks and try to become bridges. Uh, and even to see if the, for example, in the case of the University of Sao Paulo, if the other 30% of uh, faculty members that come from other institutions, if they, they bring in their networks or not. So do they share their contacts? Uh, are they, uh, is the, the, the university itself open to those uh, scholars that come from outside and do they co-author together? Do they start working together? Or are they isolated in different clusters? Uh, and uh, as time goes by, uh, nowadays we see more and more uh, that for you to produce new knowledge, you have to go over different fields, you have to talk to uh, people in different countries. Uh, so you have a lot of crossing of scientific boundaries nowadays, more than before. Uh, so it is expected that social networks and research collaboration will grow over time. So it also seems like uh, 
an interesting uh, time to look at, uh, especially with uh, the whole uh, globalization and people being more able to just do like we are doing right here, like have meetings uh, live, right? Discuss different results. Uh, so nowadays it's much easier for you to exchange knowledge and for you to, co uh, to work with people in different fields. And it's even expected if you're going to do new things to come up with new ideas from different fields, talk to people uh, and be more interdisciplinary. Uh, so this is an attempt to be the first study uh, on social networks in uh, an endogamous uh, environment. Uh, and so for this study, first uh, I was being I, I decided to take the University of Sao Paulo as a case study. And uh, first I was thinking of looking at the entire faculty body, which is uh, in the University of Sao Paulo main campus, it's around 5,000 faculty members. But once you start actually like looking at the data, it's huge. Because you're going to see that, for example, in this case, I'm going to look at uh, agricultural sciences and I start with 209 scholars and I end up with like 8,000 unique uh, collaborators because it's just that speci especially in fields like agricultural sci sciences where you co-author a lot, uh, you might have in one paper uh, like eight, nine different people uh, co-authoring that paper. I'm sure that uh, if I looked in uh, more of the social sciences, humanities, uh, the numbers of co-authors would drop and then probably uh, you would expect to have smaller networks, even though the number of faculty members are much bigger. Uh, if you look at, for example, uh, in the social sciences, I think it's the University of Sao Paulo, like uh, a fifth of the faculty members are in the social sciences. So it's a much larger group, but in terms of networks, it's probably much smaller. Uh, so the idea of this study is to try to look uh, and, and understand who do the scholars collaborate with? Are they more likely to work within their networks or not? Uh, and there, these are the three questions that I'm trying to answer with this study. So I'm trying to see how the information is uh, exchanged and produced. So basically I'm trying to look at the picture of how these networks are structured and I'm looking at it over time. So I'm looking at 20 years of research at the University of Sao Paulo. Uh, so even for social networks, you're gonna see that I actually break down into blocks of four years uh, because you, first of all, you don't, not every researcher publishes every year. Uh, and if you do, you're not gonna publish with the same people every year. So for you to actually start seeing a, a pattern in a network, you usually have to group, not with large numbers of years, but a couple of years, so that you can actually see some structure coming up. Uh, so uh, you're gonna see that I, I, uh, I'm, I try to, take pictures and see pictures of that network over time. Uh, and I try to identify if faculty members are being incentivized or discouraged from exploring gaps in, this, uh, in their structure, in their network structure. So I look at uh, what we call structural holes, which are these opportunities where you have a lot of redundant contacts. Everyone you know knows who you know. So it's like every the sources are the same, right? And then you try to find opportunities where like, oh, no one knows this person or this topic. So I'm gonna try to build a network on this. And then I'm gonna become key on that topic because if anyone in my network wants to discuss that or talk to someone about that, I'm gonna be the key person connecting to that. Uh, and um, I wanna look at uh, what happens with scholars, non-native scholars, right? The mobile scholars that move to that institution. Uh, what is the part that they are playing? Are they being key in terms of bridging, bridging communities? Uh, this could be expected because if they're coming from uh, 
a different institution, they may have already established some networks themselves. So they might be connectors of those networks. Uh, but at the same time, if they are not welcomed in, in an institution, they might also just not be connected at all at, to that uh, internal group and just keep working with whoever they were working before. So you would see like kind of like isolated uh, groups if that was the case. Uh, and the way that I uh, collected this data is uh, I had the latches ID of these professors uh, and I scraped uh, Bazi latches. So I'm going to show in the next slide basically what the scraping is. But the whole idea uh, is uh, I picked this faculty of agricultural sciences because it was looking for a field that had high collaboration, that's prestigious, uh, not only nationally, but internationally, because if it's a field that's not well connected internationally, maybe you're not going to see, uh, it's going to be too clustered because you're just going to be working with the same groups. But if it's a more prestigious field, then you, uh, with lots of mobility, because agricultural sciences also, we have had for decades programs where we send people abroad, where we receive researchers, so it seems like a field that you could see a lot of uh, networks coming and, and collaboration happening. So that's why I decided for this field. And I look at the, the last 20 years, uh, you will see how many papers, it's many papers that were published. And I also look at uh, not only published papers, but also conference papers. So I, I, I have uh, those two informations. And in the end, from those 209, as, as I was saying, I ended up with over 8,000 unique nodes, which means people that are part of that network, and uh, almost 60,000 edges, so 60,000 connections among those 8,000 people. So uh, the way that you do the scraping is I used uh, Script Latches, which is a program uh, on Python that basically you list uh, the IDs that you're looking for, and the program is gonna go to the Latches webpage, uh, try to open that CV, and it's gonna go over uh, the CAPTCHA, because that's one thing that CNPQ has added, is that for you to have access to a CV, you have to actually either like click on the images or write some kind of code, but script latches goes over that and basically uh, turns that page of information like you can see here, this researcher on the left, it turns into an HTML file. So it basically replicates that into a, a, a file that you can then manipulate. So uh, with having that uh, HTML uh, version of the CV, I can then uh, break the information the, the way I want. I can parse. I can uh, break down the co-authors. So for each paper, I can just list the authors and then do different things to just uh, kind of start designing the network. So it was a, a very useful tool. And I tried first doing Latches Extractor, which is the official way of collecting data from uh, the Scientific Council in Brazil. And it took me a year to be authorized. And when I was, it would only allow me to do one at a time. So especially in the beginning, when I was trying to do over 5,000 CVs, if I had to like do one extraction at a time, it would take me too long. And this you just kind of run the list. It takes a week basically to do 5,000, but the computer is doing that for you. So it's, it's a, an interesting way of collecting data. And this is all public data. So, so from that extraction, uh, I got you on average 500 papers uh, a year. Uh, you see that the numbers of papers as expected grows over years. Uh, we do have 2019 uh, a drop, which is not only expected uh, from uh, funding. You see that 2017, 2018, we have drops in 
in the amount of papers being published that could be due to funding. But also 2019, since it was the last year and I collected this uh, was uh, beginning of January of 2020. Some, uh, probably some faculty members haven't, hadn't updated all their CVs at that time. So maybe some of the papers were actually, we have more papers published in 2019. They were just not listed on their uh, CVs when I, when I did, the, did the scraping. And you can see here that uh, an idea of the different uh, topics that are being discussed within the field. So many papers in veterinary sciences, agriculture, food science, these are the big groups. Uh, and some are more interdisciplinary. You can see like biotechnology. So it's uh, uh, environmental sciences. So you have a mix of different papers with, within that kind of same group of researchers. And these are the first images of how the networks were looking. Uh, you can see this is already applying the idea of between a centrality. So you can see that the circles get, some of them are very small, some of them are bigger. The bigger they, they are, the more central these actors are to that network. And the colors I identified as blue, the native scholars, and green, the non-native scholars. And the gray are all the other members who co-alter or collaborate with that group. So one thing that I'm trying to identify that I haven't been able to yet is that a lot of these very small gray dots or circles, they are just the advisees, right? They, they write during that time of the PhD, they work with that advisor. So that advisor gets a lot of connections from how many advisees they have. So uh, even when I run a regression in the future, uh, I want to be able to control for how many advisees that faculty member has each year so that I can have a better idea of how many of those alter uh, are just uh, advisees that they have been adding to their papers, either as Dan may, being the main authors or just being part of uh, papers that are being written by their advisees. Luis, what, are, what determines uh, the distances that you have? Some dots are very far away. So it's uh, how connected they are. You see that the ones that are farther away, they are not very well connected to this group, right? So in the middle, it's uh, I'm I'm I have a slide later on that you you I'm kind of give a zoom because this is like a very farther away distance uh, image, but like when you go in that that map, you can see all these tiny connections that bring them together. So these groups here on the at the end, basically when you look at the end of the image. Uh, they are somehow connected, but they are connected to less members of that network. So that's why they are pushed farther away. Now, the fact that the, the later image <clears throat> suggests that the network is expanding, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, as we move, you're gonna see, uh, and you, you kind of can see here, just visually, that you kind of see the green kind of closer together and the blue kind of closer together, right? So it seems that like uh, native scholars, even though they do have connections with non-native, they still are kind of clustered. They still kind of work together. And this is just moving to the next years. What you're gonna see is maybe the blue and the green is gonna be less highlighted just because uh, the number of uh, members, it's still 209, but the number of connections is just getting bigger because the networks are getting bigger. So you're gonna see more gray coming in just because you're having all this new people being added that are not actually part of those 209, right? 209 are kind of fixed number. 
but by 2015, it seems that there, that those outliers, those very distant outliers are, are kind of disappearing. Yeah. So yeah, um, I, they're either being brought more brought together. So they are being attracted to that group or they're just breaking those bonds and just not being part anymore. So it could be that they are just through this initial connections that they had, they are make, they start working with other members and then they are brought in. Uh, one thing that we can do is add the labels to see the names. Uh, this is interesting in smaller networks because then you have a better idea of who is who. Uh, but in this kind of uh, large networks, if I added names, you wouldn't see anything but names. Uh, so, but here uh, I can see uh, like one of the, the, each one of the large groups, I have looked at this specific researcher that's in, in that group, the, the large ball. Uh, and they are, they are just key professors in that group. They, they attract people because they are like top researchers in their field. Uh, and then they just have this all all these connections being brought in but it, and it also looks like the uh the greens are much more uh constant that they're more uh, uh individual the, the the big dots mean someone who's involved in a lot of different stuff right yeah they they connect a lot of different people so it seems that the uh the 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 blue ones are there more and more people are becoming important mm -hmm. but in green that's not true because the, the blue dots seem there are more and more blue dots that seem to be getting bigger yeah so that's one of the reasons why i want to control for uh how many advices they have because i think like even if we consider like if programs are growing and they're getting more advices uh it could be that the a lot of those connections are just uh, the amount of students that they are taking in if they are taking more students than others but yeah i agree with you that it seems that the the blue as a pattern is growing it's becoming more uh central over time and then here is 2016 2019 and i just like zoomed in so that you can see like here, when you look, you see a lot of gray, but when you actually go in, you see that there are all these edges connecting different nodes. Uh, and you see how the, the native scholars have so many connections with other natives. You see a lot of blue uh, edges connecting blue nodes to each other. The, the color of the edges is based on the source. So if you see green uh, lines, green links, it means that it's coming from a non-native scholar. And if you see all the, the blue links, they're coming from, uh, from natives. And here, uh, what I did, it's, it's still not the model, the ideal model that I want to run. I want to run, uh, I will explain later, it's uh, called ERGS. Uh, but I just did a regression with fixed effects to try to just measure between a centrality. Uh, and I have identified that, of course, uh, uh, numbers of papers and numbers of conference has, have an impact on uh, how central you are and how many unique connections you have. So I control for that. But it seems that uh, native scholars are less likely to be key connectors of uh, new information of new groups. What I think it's also interesting is that it seems that faculty who reported to be internationally academic mobile also seem to be less likely to be creating those bridges. So that's something interesting that I should actually... Could you repeat the last sentence? They seem less likely to be what? what to, is that? To, to be bridges to connect uh, different research groups, different to, networks. They work. I expect them to be, to be more likely because 
you know, they, they had this experience, maybe they built their networks and they could be key to bringing in those groups. Uh, but uh, from the regression model, uh, they seem to be, uh, to have less of uh, between us effect. So native, so native scholars, meaning people who were employed by their own institution, yeah. um, are less likely to, to create new networks? It should be the links. Should be the people. They're less likely to be the link between networks. Yeah. And, and to control the flow of information, at least of new information coming in, right? You, you don't show your year fixed effects, but um, it would be interesting to interact the year with, um, you know, whatever, maybe the native, whatever one you're most interested in, to see um, whether over the years, there's an actual significant change. There is. Uh, uh, over the years, it, it, it increases because the networks is, is growing. So every year, the, that number uh, is much higher. Yeah, but the question is whether native versus non-native are increasing fast, okay. or whether this coefficient is declining mm -hmm. over time relative to the non-natives. You understand? I see. So I would show <clears throat> the year. It's groups of years, right? It's like 2000. Yeah. Yeah. So I will, because that's, that'll help you discover some of that, the change over time between, you know, what's, what's happening in those figures. Yeah. And what I had to do in this uh, is that, so for 2000, to, from 2000 to 2003, for example, they all get the same number of between a centrality the same value, but then the other controls are yearly, right? But the, but the between the centrality is fixed by that, those groups of every four years, because if I look by every year, then it could create problems because you could have an overproductive year, one year and then not the other. Uh, so what I did is for those blocks, yes, it's the between the centrality is fixed, uh, but the other variables vary every year. So I look at numbers of papers in 2000, 2001, 2002, three conferences. I control for all of that per year. The between the centrality, I, I just kept like, if it's 23 in 2000, it's 23 in 2001, 23 in 2002, 23. And then only 2004, I would change to the new block of four and so on well why don't you just do groups of years that's but uh, with uh, numbers of papers and conferences also yeah. like try to duplicate those diagrams by instead of having year fixed effects have, mm -hmm. have groups of year fixed effects okay Thank you. All right, so the next steps for this study that I wanna do is, uh, as I was saying, control for the number of uh, advisees that those uh, scholars have uh, so that I can try to see how many of them they are actually co-authoring with. Uh, I feel like in Brazil, it, it, it varies by field, but it's, uh, it's usually very likely that you're going to co-author with your uh, advisor, especially in fields like that. Uh, and I also want to apply uh, this uh, methodology called the exponential random graph model, uh, which basically uh, it runs different kinds of regressions, but controlling for how many connections you have, how many edges. So it's a model that's usually applied to social networks more than a, a simple linear regression. Uh, and the other idea, if, if, if I do have the time for my, at least my dissertation defense, is to compare the results to another field of knowledge within the University of Sao Paulo. 
the big challenge will be uh, the matching of names because this just took me forever. Uh, because different journals will collect your name a different way. So for example, when I publish in one journal, they might collect my name as LFM Gruchaki. In the other one, they might collect as uh, Gruchaki Louise. Uh, so all these alters, they, you, I had to do a matching. So even though I was scraping, especially the 209 are easier because I had their IDs. So I could basically using the IDs connect to those names. But the other uh, co-authors, I basically had to do a lot of matching of names. So to in include another field, I would have to basically do a lot of cleaning uh, on that entire uh, database. Uh, My advice is you don't do that. Right? <laughs> no, I would deepen this rather than try to get, spend a lot of time. You can, you know, you can do that as a later project. Mm -hmm. Cause that's the thing. I first, I first, I was only using the IDs and then it's very easy to run the network because using the IDs, you can know who, who is who. Uh, but then you lose on all those other connections. You basically only see that network of 209 and you don't see everyone else who's connected to that. So it's very important that you can actually like see everyone else that's not within the department that they work with. Uh, so the main takeaways uh, from, from this uh, study that I would like you to take with you is that it seems that research collaborations in the field of agricultural sciences is con continuously growing at the University of Sao Paulo. And we, we seem, I didn't cover a lot of, like I didn't talk about these two models, but there are basically three models that are discussed in social sciences of uh, how, uh, especially in academia, networks work. And it seems that in, in this case that I'm looking at, we could have a, 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 a two different models playing here which is a small world model, which basically connections of scholars are shared through acquaintances in a clustered environment. And you could also have a scale free model where you actually have key prestigious faculty that attract people to, uh, to his or her network. So, uh, so far it seems that those two uh, could be playing, those two different models could be playing a part. Uh, and finally, it seems that non-native scholars are more likely to function as bridges to non-redundant uh, contacts, helping exchange information in this kind of uh, academic networks. Thank you.